So hackers wearing hoodies is a little bit of a stereotype and it is certainly something that we see on stock hacker photographs. What do you think about the the stock image of a hacker and what do you think about the stereotype of all hackers dressing the same? I think it's it's frustrating for, for a, a whole bunch of reasons. Maybe 20 years ago, it was actually okay because let's face it, most of us did gather along and we were in our hoodies. And I actually don't have a room. Hell, I'm wearing a damn hoodie now. We've got talking about the whole hoodie idea. I have no problem with them. They're comfortable, they're nice, they're warm, they're versatile, all those other good things. They make really good presents. You know, this one's from uh, Chris Agnati stuff. Mm -hmm. What frustrates the living heck out of me, and I think what also probably puts a black eye in the industry, especially marketing and sales in our industry, is this whole portrayal of, you know, like the hood up, the no face, you, you can't see a face, it's a hood up, there's gloves on for crying out loud. I mean, how many of you try to use fucking keyboards with blood, bloody gloves on? It's the Nazgul. It's like, you know, you've got this, oh, it's a weird, mysterious thing. We can't give it a face because it'll make it, it'll make it too human. And as in our industries, we're trying to make something more and more human. And we're trying to take away this stereotype because we have to be more, you know, collaborative and communicative as, as, as the hackers in the industry. We need the marketing people to basically shut the hell up about the bullshit images and go, look, we're all human. We all have faces. If it doesn't have a face, it's probably an attacker or an adversary. It ain't a hacker. Um, and I think that's the big thing for me. It's like, look, most of us are out there. We're, we've all, so many of us are out in the public eye, are doing a whole bunch of good things and doing some amazing stuff in this industry. That when you get some dingbat in industry uh, that, that's basically like, hey, we're going to put a faceless hacker up again. It's like, did you give that shit away? So, uh, yeah, a lot of frustration there on that one. Again, love my hoodies, but I just don't want the faceless thing with the gloves. That's, that just drives me nuts. So where do you think this comes from then? You, you mentioned the marketing department trying to uh, take the face away from it. Is this the marketing department maybe trying to drive fear, uncertainty and doubt? And that's why they're going down that track? I think that's a ton of it. I mean, you know, there's definitely some mystery to a lot of what we do. No two ways about it. And it doesn't make for good television, let's be honest. And we were literally sitting there when I'm not in light. I'm literally, my lights are down. I got the blue lights or the black lights running behind me. And I'm heads down. Because I the screen resolution and the, the way I've got my screen set up is I don't need a ton of ambient light. I don't want it. So there is that mystery to what we do. No two ways about it. Um, we've not been good in the years of communicating what we do. So there's more mystery that gets added to it. It all seems voodoo and crazy, strange stuff to a lot of people. We're getting better at explaining it. It's getting easier to understand it. People are becoming more tech savvy. So that whole image has got to go the hell away because we have to be the ones that are helping. Again, it's... I will blame marketing for putting FUD out there because they're like, oh gosh, we have to sell this widget. We need to create fear to sell it. It's like, God, quit that bullshit. Do you think there's any positive side to hoodies at all? I mean, we have one thing to the positive so far is they're darn comfy, but is there anything oh, positive about it? I think that they are, I think, yeah, you're right. They're comfy. I think I do like sometimes the anonymity that comes with them. Mm. You know, you can blend in a lot more effectively. You know, we're not suited and booted. Let's put it that way. Neither would you turn up in a uniform very often unless you're like National Guard or active military or something like that. So I do love that they, they almost take that level of stress down. So I mean, I'm not exactly small. I'm six foot three and I'm hairy. So if I walk in in a suit or I walk in in uniform, people are going to be like, what the hell is it? But if I walk in in like a hoodie in my PJ bottoms, that lowers that level. You know, we all know that we're coming in. We all know that there's barriers that are up when somebody's engaging. So it takes that level of barrier down. So I think that helps a lot as well. It de-escalates the situation. So making people feel more comfortable with the idea that they're talking to somebody who's maybe an expert in a field that they don't understand. Yeah, it's, it's, it's that, it is that comfort level. It's the engagement, it's the comfort. You don't look any different than me. You know, you're wearing clothing that is comfortable and regulation and isn't like going to put me in a position of authority or anything like that. I think that's it. And quite honestly, from the social engineering standpoint, you know, it, there is that stereotype. So if you step outside that stereotype, it's actually fantastic because people are like, uh, I didn't expect that. So again, you take that barrier down. You know, Jason Street is another mm -hmm. amazing person in the industry and you'll see him walk into places in a business suit and it just doesn't compute. People are like, uh, you're a hacker in a business. Oh, oh, well, maybe we will listen to you. You know, it's great. It breaks the stereotype. So is it true that all hackers wear hoodies then? Is it, it's our comfy clothes and that's it? You, you know, um, would you go as far as saying you're not a hacker if you don't wear hoodies? 
No, I would not say that. I mean, again, that that to me is being very stereotypical of like US and Europe hackers. I have met some freaking amazing people over in the Middle East. I mean, I was out in Dubai and Qatar and Oman and places like that. They're not wearing hoodies over there. One, because the desert really isn't conducive to wearing a big thick hoodie. And secondly, you know, the amazing robes and clothes that they wear, I think are actually just as much fun. So I would say it's not a you're not a hacker unless you wear one. But I do think, you know, from a chosen clothing and go to, they are pretty damn nice and pretty usable. So overall, then, you know, should we get rid of the the hoodie? We've talked about how, yes, it's got some positive, but maybe it's not great for us trying to break into the professional side of, of our industry. Should we have a campaign to to maybe ban the hoodie? No, I, and that's because, again, you know, you, you and I, I mean, they're comfortable, they're nice, they're clothing. I work in the thing probably 20, well, 18 to 20 hours a day. So it's nice. And so, what I do want to ban is the faceless hoodie. So what I want to ban is the faceless hoodie. That, that to me, is the BS move. Um, if you are going to portray us, great, put a face to it. Because, again, you, we don't need to be selling with fear, uncertainty, and doubt. We don't need the Nazgul sales. We don't need the... The oh my gosh, the boogeyman's coming to get us kind of bullshit. Any sales done that way, the company needs to be taken out and tasered for all I care. <laughs> um, it is what it is. I mean, I don't care if you tar and feather them for all I care at that point. That is a BS move. Um, you want to put somebody up there and they go, okay, this is the bad person. Go to the FBI's top 10 list of electronic, go steal a couple of their faces, go find the adversaries and the attackers. Put a face to a name. That way, every other person on the planet will start to associate and recognize. Much different than the faceless rubbish. Is the is the hoodie just uh, one aspect of a bigger problem then? Because I see you're talking about differentiating between hacker, attacker, maybe threat actor here. Is this uh, is just one aspect that we're picking on of maybe a bigger problem? Yeah, I think very much so. I mean, we've been, you know, the, the word hacker has been abused in industry for more years than we care to think of. I mean, let's face it, it used to come with a very positive connotation, a very, very positive connotation outside of the computer industry, and definitely outside of the security industry. Well, it's been picked up inside the security industry, no problems there. And then again, unfortunately, it's been twisted. News, media, marketing, whatever, need to blame somebody. You know, you need to blame somebody. So why don't you pick up on a word that everybody understands, hacker? So there is a hell of a fight. Whether we're winning it or losing it, I don't know. I mean, that's why I love the hacking is not a crime. Yeah. You know, the work that's being done by that team is freaking amazing. I mean, Chloe and everybody else are actually amazing doing some stuff there. So for me, that's that's where I think I get frustrated with it. Because again, there's a lot of us that are doing a shit ton load of good. And there's some amazing people out there doing all sorts of amazing stuff in all sorts of walks of life, free of charge and everything else. Um, I mean, you look at HFC. So there's all the good that's been done, and then it gets ruined because some dingbat spanner decides to go out there and marketing and go, "Oh, we're going to just blame the hackers again." We had it this week. I was on a, I was, I'm getting ready to do a conference tomorrow, and even the marketing team for the organization I, I'm doing some work with, put out hacker in the in the negative way, and I'm like, "Come on, get 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 your shit together, people." So it's easy, it's too easy. I think it's just too easy. It's too easy to blame that as opposed to go, it is an attacker, it is an adversary, it is a criminal, it is a threat actor. <clears throat> so I think that's definitely part of the challenge. Awesome. Well, Chris, thanks for, uh, thanks for your comments and for introducing the, uh, the talk today. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks very much and uh, good luck and hope it goes well. Hello and welcome to the Cyber House Party. Do hackers wear black hoodie session? I am here ready with my black hoodie. I've got Alyssa, FC and Jay with me. And Melissa, can you start with introductions? Who are you and, and how did you get on this panel? Sure. Uh, I'm Melissa Miller. I'm a hacker, a security researcher, and a application security advocate. I actually work as, that's my actual title, application security advocate for a company called Sneak. Um, I've been hacking computers since I was 12. Um, I've been doing professional security work since or for the last 15 years now. So I guess that's kind of how I ended up here. Awesome. FC, who are you and how did you end up on this panel? My name is FC. I'm the co-founder and co-CEO of Sygenta. I've been a hacker since for the last ooh, 20 mumble years. <laughs> Jay? Uh, I'm Jay. I um, started the company Digital Interruption. Um, I mostly do pen, t uh, pen testing, um, security consulting. Been kind of working at this professionally for um, for a while and doing it 
uh, kind of unprofessionally for even longer. Thanks. So uh, just to, to fill in who I am, uh, my name is Holly Gross Williams. I'm the MD at Sakama here, and I'm going to try and wrangle this panel into talking about um, stereotypes of hackers. So that's why we're bringing up the, the hackers in hoodies stereotype. But um, how does the, the panel feel about stereotypes? Do you feel that the general public think that um, there's just one kind of hacker, we're all the same? Or do we think it's a little bit more complicated? Well, I, mean, I think if we, if we look at Trump, uh, sorry to go there straight away, but <laughs> he seems to have these two opinions, right? So one is the basement dweller. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other one is this crazy high intellect, uh, you know, super hacker. Uh, and I think that does kind of mirror what a lot of people tend to think either they're some loser who is just you know doing things because they want to cause trouble yeah and then some kind of computer genius yeah i i mean i think like most stereotypes it it comes from a place where there's like maybe a nugget of reality to it but there's an awful lot of damaging garbage that goes along with it right uh i mean it's it's no mystery to most people that, you know, hacker culture began with a lot of folks who were kind of misfits or just didn't fit into regular society. I mean, a lot of us, we all grew up on BBSs or, or IRC channels. And that was, you know, those were our friends. We hung out there and that, that was kind of the thing we did. But yeah, the reality is, we're still all very different people. We don't all hang out in dark basements. I mean, you know, we're all here today, all pretty well lit up with really awesome cameras and not afraid to show our faces. We're not quite that clandestine image that a lot of people in society still have of uh, what a hacker is. Yeah, I, th I think it's uh, very much that. It's like, you know, maybe back when we were kids, we used to hang out in hoodies because we didn't want to be seen by other people. Um, I remember hanging out in London as a 15, 16 year old and not wanting the cameras to capture my face. So not because I was doing anything illegal, just because I didn't like the thought of being seen on camera. Mm -hmm. The irony <laughs> right now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it means nothing. Yeah, I wore a hoodie then because I was cold and I didn't have any money, so I couldn't buy anything nice. Um, and still today, I'll wear a hoodie if it's cold, but today it's not cold, so I'm not wearing a hoodie. What do you feel about the public perception of the, the job titles? So I noticed there, Jay, that you introduced yourself as you know, doing penetration testing. Do you think the general public understand what penetration testing is or do they understand how that relates to hacking? Um, no, definitely not. And I've actually, I've gone through various job titles. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of lucky because I, I do run the company, I can experiment. And that is something that I did at the beginning. I started by introducing myself as, um, like a security consultant, people tend to thought I was trying to sell things to them all the time. Um, then the penetration tester, people, I don't know, I'm going to say what people thought I was trying to do. <laughs> uh, so I've actually, what I tend to use now when speaking to people that, you know, don't know these terms is ethical hacker. I know that has a lot of impl implications um, in terms of, you know, is hacking ethical? Is it not? And all the things that we discuss a lot. Um, but when dealing with people that don't understand the terms, I find ethical hacker does does let them understand it a bit better. Um, I guess because there's an the idea they they know what hacker kind of means, and ethical means that it is doing it for the right reasons. So I've in like a job um, kind of environment that they, they they do kind of get it. But I guess that pl plays on some of the stereotypes as well, right? That hacking is by default bad. Alyssa, you go by security advocate, do you not? Is, is that something that's come up for you as well, where you're trying to pick and choose a job title that best uh, describes what it is that you do and maybe hacker as job title doesn't work? Well, so it's kind of interesting, right? Because for the longest time, I did avoid using the moniker hacker. And obviously, the way I introduce myself today is honestly the way I introduce myself anytime I'm at a public speaking event or it's, you know, it's what's in my bio. And it wasn't... I used to hide it because I kind of felt like, yeah, it was, you know, especially with the public perception of what a hacker is, a lot of the pejorative use of that term in the media in particular. And of course, we've all seen all the imagery and stuff that they associate with it, too. I, I didn't think that that was compatible with the leadership roles that I was in. And so, you know, I, I kind of had moved away from that term and really never, I mean, I used to see an ethical hacker and I even stopped using that term. Um, and I used every other term you could imagine. 
And it wasn't until last year I actually met, um, you know, kind of one of my, I, I hate to use this term, but InfoSec heroes, uh, who does identify herself as a hacker. And, you know, she was up there giving a keynote right before my keynote at a, a big corporate event. And I'm like, it, it was at that point that I kind of realized, yeah, I can still embrace this. And and actually it, it, it can be used to effective means, but... There's a long way to go because, like I said, yeah, the media in particular is so brutal about this. Um, and, I mean, I'm sure we'll, we'll get into that, but I know myself and a lot of our peers have been starting to speak up more and more to the media about, you know, how they're using the term hacker versus what a cyber criminal is versus, you know, other terms that can be used to differentiate. FC, how do you deal with the problem of job titles and public perception? So it, it's very much down to, you know, you have to choose the right words for the right audience. If you're sitting in front of the, the US embassy, for example, you don't tend to use the word hacker, you use cybersecurity consultant or expert. Um, if you're standing in front of some kids, you, you use the word hacker because they understand it and it grabs their attention. So it really is like almost everything with cybersecurity is like you choose the right thing, the right tool for the right place. How do you feel that impacts working with businesses then? So um, FC here is mentioning that when talking to kids versus talking to, you know, the government entities and people like that, we might choose different words. But um, Jay, when you work with businesses, do you introduce your services and penetration testing with as particular terms or do you talk about what it is that you're going to do? Do you go in with breaking into computers or do you go in with a hacker or something else? So we, we put a lot of effort into trying to make what we do not scary. So we, we try to talk about ways that we will help companies to like save money, to release quicker, like the things that they actually care about. And so that, that's the things we try to talk about, not so much the, the hacking thing. Businesses ultimately don't really care about that. What they care about is making sure that they can release a product to the quality that they can afford. So that, that tends to be the, the approach I take. I mean, I don't know whether that's, you know, maybe not the coolest, but <laughs> it seems to work. <laughs> do, you, do you worry about the cool factor, Jay? Is it, is it, uh... I do, I do, yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Alyssa, how does it impact you? Do, do companies understand what advocate means and that you're there to help? Or do you, do you find that you have to um, separate things between talking to the public and talking to businesses as maybe a different way of speaking? Yeah, I mean, if I'm walking into a business meeting, most of the time I'm not going to introduce myself as hacker first. Um, you know, it's it, it's usually more with job title at that point because it's a business meeting. Um, you know, and and yeah, I mean, to Jay's point, yeah, they are there. It is really what am I bringing to your business in terms of value? What am I here to do for you? So whether it's as an advocate. Um, whether it was in you know one of my previous roles as the leader of a security practice or whatever, um, you know, it, yeah, that it, it does. You, you you definitely have context sensitive ways of introducing yourself, and you're gonna you're gonna use what makes sense for the context. Um, it's just for me, hacker. Like I said, in the last two years now, has it, it, I've come to the realization that it doesn't hold me back to use that in certain cases either. And in fact, it, it does lend itself to some credibility. Um, and it honestly is the most accurate way to describe what I do. FC, how do you grab businesses' attention and make sure that they understand what it is that you offer? Yeah, I, th I think what I tend to do is try and differentiate for them and educate them that if I use the word hacker, that is not the same as criminal. And they're two very separate things. And this harks back to Jay's point earlier about ethical hacker. I try not to even use ethical hacker because to whose ethics are you subjecting that to? Is it your own? In which case, you know, someone like Snowden would be ethically within his own mind and his own rules, an ethical hacker. Well, he's not. <laughs> so he's a criminal. So you, you can't really even use ethical hacker as a term, I think. So trying to educate the media and businesses and the and the general public that hacker doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing. It's just a thing that we do. Yeah, I find it kind of interesting that we're, um, you know, as hackers, we want to break things down and figure them out. And we're even doing that with terms like, oh, <laughs> we, we use this term and this way that it has this effect and this impact. I think that's kind of cool.
Yeah, I, I think mean, I think it does it does play into the stereotype there of doesn't it of being like um, analytical about yeah. how we approach problems. Yeah, I mean, th- this conversation right now reminds me of a kind of the most uh, important concept in all this, and it, it's a quote from uh, Jason Street mm-hmm. uh, from a number of years ago, and I believe it or not, I literally do have this tattooed on my back, and his quote was that hackers are you know, artists and inventors were not criminals and freaks. I mean, and and he did this great talk where he went through and talked about, you know, where hacking got its beginnings in like 16th century Europe and, and you know, people that you, pe- that general public wouldn't think of as hackers, but I mean, Nikola Tesla, mm-hmm. look at everything that guy, absolutely a hacker and we wouldn't have a lot of the technology we have today without him. Um, you know, I mean, you could say the same for, you know, and go through any in- inventor and look at what they did. They sat down with what they had on hand in terms of technology and they worked with it and they created new things and they made it work in a different way or whatever. And as a result, we ended up with technology that allows us to have this conversation that we're having right here. So, so is it more of the fact that we shouldn't be using the word hacker anymore? We, we, we should reinvent ourselves as inventors. So we're cybersecurity inventors instead. Maybe no one calls themselves an inventor anymore. You, you're just seen as a crackpot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that that's an interesting question. I don't know. Does the inventor... I mean, I'm not sure inventor necessarily fits either because we do more than invent. We do break down technology, but we break it down for the purpose of understanding it and improving it as opposed to breaking it down for the purpose of committing a crime. And that's where, you know, I always think of hacker as like it's a broad umbrella term. And then you've got criminals under that under that umbrella. You've got inventors under that umbrella. You've got security professionals under that umbrella i think the uh, the next question then bringing it back to the the black hoodie problem talk about expectations and realities but expectations first uh, jay when you go on site or you work with a customer do they expect you to turn up in a black hoodie are they maybe shocked if you were to wear a suit how how do you approach the appearance so I don't think they, they say much. A lot of the clients I work with are very strict, I'm um, sorry, very relaxed dress things anyway, so they don't really care. Um, but in terms of what they expect me to do, yeah, there's a there's a big thing there. You know, this this um this when, when they stop, when, sorry, when they don't want to like give you creds because you're the hacker, right? Mm. You don't need creds for this test. Go and hack it. Like, yeah, okay, that's gonna take me like a month, or you can just give me the creds. It's, it's ten seconds. I can move on to the next bit. So I, I find that that's the bit that really gets in the way in terms of, you know, how we dress to be I tend to dress, you know, similar to whoever the client is. So I think from, from their perspective, I'm just like them anyway. But yeah, it's, it's the role that, that tends to, to kind of trip us up a bit more. Is that is that fitting into their environment? Then you, you uh, dress to the client expectations as opposed to the expectations yeah. of your role? Yeah, exactly. I do try to do that. Yeah. FC, how do you find it? Do you have a, a uniform or do you take it case by case? So it has to be case by case, just like Jay said. It's like, you know, you dress for the environment that you're going into, especially if you're doing social engineering tests, mm. for example. Putting on a yellow jacket isn't going to get you into a lot of the places that I get into, but wearing a nice shirt and tie and, and shiny black shoes is going to get you in there. But I have had the occasions when I do a lot of public speaking. Of You know, I've had uh, one client, a massive audience in the middle of the desert. I'm not going to say where, um, but they were like, oh, so you're going to come on, like, with your hood up and i'm like hood i'm wearing a baseball cap in the desert like i'm already hot enough i'm not going to wear a hoodie and they're like well it'd be really good if you could because then it shows that you're the hacker and i'm like all right i'll put a hoodie on for you <laughs> and sort of come out even though the lighting's terrible it's just like ugh. so you have to just give some uh, give and take i think with dress code but I like the fact that it shows that this industry is free enough to accept any dress. Alyssa, what do you find within within your role? How is it different for you? Do people have an expectation of business formal or, or can you flex it a little bit? I mean, I think, 
you know, first of all, clients, yeah, it, my rule has always been dress one level above what their typical dress is. I mean, that, that, I think most consultants kind of know that story. Um, but yeah, I mean, in general appearance wise, I, I think that that is a really good point. I've seen that. I, I, I think as an industry, we've kind of come to accept that people have all sorts of different looks and you're going to get different things. I'm, I mean, I spoke about that corporate event earlier and I remember, you know, I was up there, had a, I actually wore a white blazer, long story. Um, and you know, I, I gave this keynote and then later we're at lunch and I took my jacket off and I was wearing a sleeveless top underneath and all of a sudden everybody saw my, uh, my tattoos and they're like, oh, you should have taken your jacket off on stage when you're talking about being a hacker. That would have been perfect. And I'm like, I don't know that tattoos connects with that, but okay. It's, you know, it, and it wasn't like no one was shocked to see tattoos. They didn't, it didn't bother anybody, which in a very conservative brand protective environment to get that kind of reaction was kind of impressive, but it speaks to, I think, you know, FC's point that, it is becoming at least a little more accepted that look, you know, everybody's got their own look, their own body modifications, whatever else. And that's not a reliable way to judge somebody's professionalism or their capabilities. So nobody's right. like sneaking a hoodie on underneath the blazer or something. So as you get there, you can pick which one last minute is what to. <laughs> I, I think it also works the other way around though. I was, uh, you know, before lockdown, I was in a, a round table with Department of Defense, Facebook, and a couple of other big names. And I was very underdressed. I was basically dressed like this, and they're all in suits. And because I had this persona um, sitting there, they were all focused on me because of, they thought, oh, hang on, he's got some legitimacy here. He's not just like a guy in a suit. He's someone that's on the, on the front line doing this sort of stuff so we should listen to. So it actually gave me a bit more power in that room than probably wearing a suit would have done. I'm going to come back to you for this one, FC. Do you find that the persona is a powerful thing within the secure industry and something that maybe you want to hold on to? Or do you find that, you know, maybe we should be looking at what is the future of security from the client's expectations? What do you think is the most powerful? I, I think the image is very powerful still. Um, you know, it kind of leads a bit of credence and a bit of gravitas to what you're doing and that you know what you're doing because you kind of dress like that. It's kind of stupid sort of tribalism that they sort of worship almost like oh my god it's the hacker coming in and you see people whispering when you're walking through the it department you're like i'm just just dressed as me man it's like you you've got the wrong image there but well, it's kind of cool <laughs> you know so <laughs> Jay, you have you, to play up to it a little bit Jed, do you uh cultivate a persona or or is this just you um a bit of both i think it depends um, where I am, who I'm talking to, uh, but it's like a similar thing to what FC just said. Um, I was dealing with with someone once, and we were the first security people that they had ever met that was just wearing like a t-shirt and stuff, um, and that kind of blew their mind. And I was like, "But this is this is what most of us wear, like most of the time." But I guess from their perspective, the only security people they they had met were people that had gone on site with them. Um, so they'd come to our offices, so things were a bit different, but normally, you know, um, people come go on site, they see them there, obviously wearing a suit because they're consultants. So yeah, they, they just couldn't like get past it that we were just just like one of them, just like a, a dev and things. But yeah, just this is just what people wear. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I think, um, you know, doing things publicly, you, you do have to have some kind of image that you put out, which isn't always the same as, as what maybe you are, but what you want to be, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, that's why I always wear the baseball cap. It's kind of a brand thing that's yeah. stuck, and it makes people remember me. So I can guarantee you the last time I was in the House of Commons, everyone remembers the guy in the baseball cap. They don't remember the guy in the blue suit. Yeah, very true. Alyssa, do you find that you have a persona within the work environment, within that the hacking environment, or, or is it just a, a single you? So uh, that's kind of an interesting question because, yeah, it, it ultimately is a single me. I mean, I, I've spent a lot of my life putting on a different face and, and being, you know, living to a persona or an expectation. But I, just, I do still keep a brand for myself, right? I mean, you, you do want people to recognize you, but that's just it. It's my authentic brand, much like FC with the baseball cap. For me, anytime you see me in a speaking engagement, for instance, I've always got a blazer on. Now, they're usually 
they're not your typical suit blazer. It's stuff like this. I've got a really cool lambskin leather one. You know, I mean, I've, I've got like cool stuff, you know, but, um, you know, so there is, there's just, it, it's that vibe that it, it's what's me. You know, I, I have a, a colleague who talks about, um, his phrase is what's your weird. And it, what he talks about is how you embrace just that thing about you that's super authentic and is only you and, and makes you stand out and make that a part of who you are. So, I mean, I leverage that quite a bit, but, uh, you know, kind of steering back a little more into the question, I, I think the one place where I have found I can kind of leverage that kind of, that sort of hacker cool is similar to like what Jay was talking about in environments in particular, actually with coworkers who just never worked with a hacker before. And so you can kind of use, you know, that term. And I, and I don't mean like overtly manipulating them or anything, but sometimes just the fact that they know that does get that little bit of extra credibility or something uh, like uh, FC was talking about where, yeah, they're, they like, oh yeah, what does what does Alyssa think? She's she's the hacker after all, and and you know you'll get that kind of thing. And so yeah, I mean I'll, I'll use that when it's there, but I tend to use that sparingly. It's more, I just want to be perceived for who I am, and um, you know people can kind of take it or leave it at this point in my career. I just that's kind of who I am. So FC, you mentioned something earlier about uh, physical access testing and how people maybe expect you to look when you uh, do the breaking into building side of things. Do you think maybe the stereotypes play in your favor if you go on site and you don't look like a criminal, if you don't look yeah. like their expectation of a hacker? Yeah, it very much does. You know, if, if I if I go on site, you know, I have done before in a balaclava and dark blue clothes and breaking in literally then you know there, there's an expectation from that if i go into a bank i generally don't go in in a balaclava i go in in the most expensive suit i can find because as Alyssa said earlier you you dress slightly more than the client does so you have to match it and slightly exceed it that can go wrong sometimes i remember scoping out a bank uh, headquarters of a bank and i put on my suit got in there in the morning and then noticed that everyone else it was in onesies because they were having some charity fun day. <laughs> it, was that, it was that point that I decided to nope out of that test because it's like, I am not wearing a onesie for this job. <laughs> but I'll come back when they're wearing suits. I'm a little bit disappointed with that answer, if I'm honest. <laughs> I would have loved to hear the story of like, yeah, sometimes I do physical access in a onesie, you know, fit to your environment. <laughs> Do uh, Jay or Alyssa, do you have anything like that that you think impacts your role where you can actually use the hacker stereotype in your favor? I mean, I kind of spoke to it before. I think it helps with, um, you know, as, as a security advocate, I mean, half my job is getting out in public speaking. Um, it, and that's something I've been doing for years, even before getting into this role. And I think, you know, to claim and own that term it, it does make it stand out a bit. Like when I'm submitting a CFP or um, it, I think it's, I've noticed it's also helpful when I look at just at Google Analytics, how people end up at my website when they, they come to me and offer me a, a speaking position at their event. It's so many times I, I look and I can see their search terms had something to do with hacker. Sometimes it's Alyssa Miller hacker. Sometimes it's just security hacker. And my name apparently showed up in the list of results. It's, um, which is great, you know, and, and so it does help, uh, you know, again, back to that whole credibility thing. It, um, I mean, I'll, I'll even admit and sneak, don't get nervous, please. Um, I mean, I had an executive search firm reach out to me at one point because that was in my LinkedIn profile and they had somebody who was looking for an executive role. And part of what the, uh, you know, they had told this search firm was that they wanted a, a hacker type person. And so they went looking and they found a hacker on my profile and they, they dialed me up. So, you know, it, it happens, it can be effective. I don't do physical pen testing. So the, the look doesn't, you know, really play into that as much, I guess, but for me, but, um, yeah, that's, uh, it, it has its moments. Okay. So the last question for everybody, I'm going to talk about kind of recruitment diversity and how that's impacted by the stereotype. 
So FC, if you were talking to somebody who's looking to break into security and they were worried that maybe the stereotype or expectation from the industry didn't fit well with them, what kind of advice would you give to that person? I'd say you're not how you dress, right? You're not the person that you dress as or how you perceive the world perceives you. Um, it's never going to hold you back, but just embrace it. Jay, somebody is worried about how the stereotype of hackers might impact them, but they're really interested in cybersecurity. What, what would you say to reassure them? Um, yeah, good, really good question. I, I'm not sure. I'm trying to think back to what would have helped me because when I, you know, was first started, I didn't, I didn't really even understand this was an industry. Um, I just kind of fell into it, to be honest. I didn't know it was something that I could have done. Uh, it definitely had an impact, you know, not like the people that were in it, you know, the fact that I did look different to them, that definitely impacted me. Um, so I, I would say that the people who are here really do make an effort to um, to, to make it a, a open and welcoming place. You know, as FC said, you know, to show people that, that they can be themselves because we need people from like every background. There was that thing with the dancer, you know, the advert. I'd love to get people in cybersecurity that have dancing backgrounds, like art backgrounds. I think that would be amazing. We'd be able to do like so much better. Um, so yeah, that's really what I have to say. Alyssa, somebody wants to get into security, they may be looking into a security advocate role or cybersecurity in general, but they don't think they suit a hoodie. What would you say to that person? Um, first of all, I would ask them to correct their perception of cybersecurity. Um, unfortunately, so many people, the minute they think about security roles, they think about pen testing, hacking, you know, that that's right where their mind goes. And indeed, I mean, you know, let, let's be honest, there still is that mystique of the hacker and it, it's got a cool thing to it. But the fact of the matter is, oh my gosh, there are so many roles in cybersecurity that you can be a part of. And the best part is you can try one. Find out you don't like it, and you can easily pivot to another. That's what makes this industry so cool. And, oh, God, Jay, you brought up those ads, which frustrate me only because what frustrates me is the the way they were received because one of those ads is a barista. And, damn it, if I don't have a talk track going right now, which is from barista to cybersecurity professional, that is the title of my talk. And so – They've now unfortunately taken my my metaphor because I talk about exactly that. How do you go from being this person who works in a coffee shop? How do you take the skills you learn there and apply that to security? Because we do need that diversity and there are transferable skills you learn as a barista that will fit you in security. And so you don't have to become a hacker. I mean, you working as a, and this is my metaphor that I use, working as a barista, you got a lot of the skills that we look for in a SOC analyst. Let's get you in the SOC watching the sim and, and digging through alerts and reacting and responding to these things because you've already got the skill set to do it. Awesome. So Alyssa, FC, Jay, thank you very much for being on the panel. And everybody, thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.